So thanks for the wonderful conference and wonderful speakers. Also thanks to the people who gave me money and the people who gave me ideas. Uh, so again, my talk is in this context of measurement-induced transitions. Uh, Matthew gave a nice introduction. Uh, you have these random unitaries plus measurements. And when you have lots of measurements, you end up having an area law. Weak measurements, you end up having a volume law. Uh, I think in the middle of his talk, you might have missed it, but he talked about uh, mixed states. So if you start your system in the mixed state, uh, the measurements, if they're strong enough, will purify the system, and if they're weak enough, they won't. Uh, and this transition, looking at it this way, has a very nice connection to a quantum information problem or a game played between Bob and Alice. And so say Bob and Alice were once dating. Uh, she's written some secrets in her diary, and Bob doesn't want those secrets to exist anymore. Uh, and so he's trying to destroy those secrets by shining light on it uh, to make some measurements or generate some errors. Uh, the light reflected has, say, the measurement outcomes, and Alice is going to collect all of that light and attempt to reconstruct her uh, diary um, based off of the late time state of the qubits and the measurement outcomes. And so her ability to do this uh, actually, actually corresponds exactly to the amount of purity left in the system at late times. So the number of bits she can recover is equal to the number of uh, uncertain bits in the density matrix at late times. And so, yeah, in the strong measurement phase, the system purifies and she can't recover anything. Bob is one. Uh, while in the weak measurement phase, Alice can recover her diary um, up to, say, k bits, where k is the channel capacity. And so that's the basic story when these uh, unitaries are completely random. Uh, I, ideally, Alice has access to the full set of unitaries to do this. But if she is restricted in some way, we can ask, say, what can she do if she's constrained in her ability to generate coherence? And by coherence, I mean is basically ability to generate quantum uncertainty in a given basis. Uh, so the cat state is your ideal uh, quantum uncertainty, uh, like state that has quantum uncertainty. Uh, and I'll tell you more precisely what this is in a bit. But first, a quick teaser. So the first message is if she has no coherence in her initial state, and she's unable to generate coherence, then she can only protect classical diaries. And so that measurement-induced transition becomes a transition in the classical channel capacity. Uh, and if your error threshold is small enough, she can correct, say, 10 bits of information. And if it's uh, large enough, she, can only correct, she can't correct any. Um, Bob can actually generate coherence. And this may be of utility to her. And when he does this, depending on the measurements he's making, you can generate. Uh, there we go. Entanglement transitions? Oh, there we go. The point here. Um, so this is at a very weak measurement rate. And these probabilities are the relative rates at which Bob is making a measurement in, say, the x, y, and z direction. And so at this really low rate of probabilities, if she could apply at the full set of unitaries, she would produce volume law phases. But here she can tune or Bob can tune a transition from a volume law to area law phase by uh, making only X or Z measurements um, if Alice's ability to generate unitaries is restricted. Um, I'm going to say all of these things in more detail in a bit. And then the final thing is unitaries can also generate coherence. So if Alice has a ability to generate coherence at a certain rate, then she can end up correcting uh, a certain amount of decohering errors at another given rate. And if she can measure it at, if she can apply these phase gates at a sufficiently strong uh, rate, then any relative ratio to decohering versus non-decohering measurements, uh, she can correct. And again, I'll say all this in more detail. Um, and it kind of the message we were getting from reading all of this was that coherence is a requirement for channel capacity, having quantum channel capacity. And briefly, at the end, I'll mention this this bound on the code distance for quantum channel capacity. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll say it. For for all of this, I'm starting in pure states. 
uh, and the coherence is, in a, is a basis specific quantity. So actually, I think I say this next. So the, the way I'm considering coherence is trying to quantify how much you are in a cat state, or this is the, the kind of brief picture. Um, so you can have two ways you're uncertain about the cat's life. Uh, one is a complete mixed state. Uh, and here, you're completely uncertain about which physical state the cat is in. Um, while here, you know perfectly the physical state, but you still don't know whether the, state, the cat is alive or dead. Uh, and the important kind of numerical quantity here is that this one has off-diagonal terms while this one has diagonal terms. And important is that this density matrix only has off-diagonal terms in a given basis. So the amount of coherence or amount of quantum uncertainty you have in a given state is something that is basis specific. Uh, so this is why a unitary could generate or not generate coherence um, based off of how it acts in a given basis. Um, and so actually the way, the quantifier I'll use for uh, coherence is coming from the resource theory of coherence, uh, similar to this uh, resource theory of entanglement where you can define this relative entropy quantifier of entanglement. This is this relative entropy of coherence. Uh, it's defined based off of these uh, projectors into your given basis state. Uh, and this is the quantities given here. So you first uh, project your density matrix into uh, basically throw away all the off-diagonal terms, uh, compute the entropy of the density matrix there, and then subtract that from the entropy of just the bare density matrix. And so your coherence is your uncertainty about which basis state you're in minus the uncertainty about which pure state you're in. And so there's somehow a pigeonhole principle here. If you have n bits of basis state uncertainty and n less than n bits of pure state uncertainty, you can only quantify how much you're uncertain about that basis. Um, you're, you're kind of restricted in how you can assign that basis uncertainty to the pure states. Yes, yes, so, so every, every basis has a relative entropy of coherence. And I'll focus on two, which are the X and Z basis, uh, based computational and the, the phase. Um, so here's a simple example where you have a state which is a um, just basic quantum superposition uh, in the X, zero, and one basis. It has this density matrix. If you move the off diagonal terms, you just get the probability distribution to being in zero and one. And since this is a pure state, the entropy of the density matrix is zero, and this is just the entropy of your probability distribution of zero and one. Um, well, if you have an incoherent density matrix, uh, this thing, the diagonal ensemble is equal to the density matrix, and so this term is zero. Uh, a more non-trivial example is um, for a multi-qubit state where you take m qubits mixed, so the entropy of the, your state is m, uh, then the rest, so the next nx bits are polarized in the x direction and nz bits are polarized in the z direction. And so your uncertainty about the z states are nx plus m, and if you plug that into this, you find that the coherence in the z basis is the number of x polarized states, because the x polarized states are the ones which are uncertain about the z basis. And similarly for uh, the, the x basis. Okay, so uh, C naughts can't generate coherence in the X or Z basis, and if Alice is restricted in only being able to apply C naughts, then you get a lot of interesting things. Uh, so the first thing, actually to see why this is, if you take then a, a C naught gate to the X basis state, you just flip the second bit condition on the first one, and there's a nice duality between X and Z basis states for C naught gates, and so the same thing happens with the Z basis state. So you have X basis states to X basis states, Z basis states to Z basis states. You can't generate any coherence in either of those basises. And so the coherence is conserved throughout the circuit. Uh, this has an interesting effect on entanglement. Uh, this is because the entanglement of any reduced density matrix uh, of your system is bounded by the minimum coherence in any basis, any local basis. Uh, this is only true if you start in a pure state. So this is a statement about pure states. Um, things generalize to mixed states, but the quantities are different. Um, I'm going to work with pure states, so 
this quantity you can think of. And so say you have a fixed amount of coherence in the X basis, say 10 bits. Uh, if your system size is smaller than 10 bits, then you're just bounded by the size of the subsystem. And so you have your normal linear scaling of entanglement. But once you reach the bound by coherence, it levels off and you can't generate any more entanglement. Um, and so actually the fun thing is that volume law or area law states depend on the amount of coherence in the system. If your coherence scales with the volume law, then you can get an entanglement that scales with volume law, uh, say like this one. Uh, but if you have a coherence that is constant with the size of your system, then you'll be fixed in an area law state. Uh, and I guess that can have a fun statement on thermalization and just see that it'll have interesting statements on error correction. Okay, so first the coherence free limit. Um, so if I start completely polarized in X basis such that I have uh, zero coherence in the X basis and um, I apply random C naughts and bit erasers. Both of these operations don't generate coherence. And so at the end of the circuit, I'm still in an X basis state. And so this whole thing is just a classical map from one X basis state to another X basis state. And the question of if Alice can recover her, say, classical diary she stores in this state is whether if F of T is invertible. And there's actually a transition, as I've already told you. Uh, and from where she can save her diary to where she can't save her diary. Uh, there's actually similar work, I think, soon come out by Altman's group and I think already out by Knowles' group. Um, I know Altman has showed that uh, this thing corresponds to percolation. Um, and actually one way to see that quickly is that zero is an absorbing state and so it's an absorbing state transition. So now the question is, uh, can this channel protect quantum information? Um, what I mean is suppose I put a quantum state here, do I get at late times just the quantum state with the, the X states mapped to X states? Uh, or if I wanna be more careful, I have some uh, wave functions, they have some phases, and I wanna know if I can recover these phases at late times. Um, if I do this, I will certainly not get this state at the end, I'll just decohere everything, and uh, I won't be able to protect my um, quantum state. So is there another way that a bit eraser can be performed such that I do protect this state? Um, this can be done with measurements. So here we're imagining either Bob measures in the X basis and the Z basis. As soon as Alice figures, finds that out, she might not know how to decode that error, so she just puts it into the zero state. Um, so if we start in a Bell state, which has coherence one, if Bob measures X and Alice flips it to zero, uh, then you lose coherence. Um, while if Bob measures Z, Alice can rotate that state to zero and you get something like this. The coherence is preserved, you just have a sign error. But you know what the sign error is if you know what the measurement outcome is. And so if you have a state like this, um, if you destroy coherence, you'll lose the phases, if not, you'll have the phases up to some sign errors, but you know what those sign errors are, and so you can correct the, the quantum state. Uh, and so as long as your classical channel is reversible, your quantum channel will be reversible. And that's what you show. Actually, the quantum channel capacity, I roughly defined as the purity on that first slide, or second slide, um, ends up being the same as the classical channel capacity. Uh, and the, really the important thing is that these bit erasers must preserve coherence. If you don't preserve coherence, you destroy the phases immediately. Uh, and so this means Bob has to be restricted in the basis he can measure. If Bob has full freedom in what basis he can measure, then this is not gonna be, these CNOTs aren't gonna be a good way to protect quantum information. Um, and so now we want to find out how to turn this classical channel quantum, uh, basically, what can Alice do to make a quantum channel, uh, protect a quantum diary? And so there's a few lessons we can take from quantum error correction. Uh, there, this actually same problem occurs. So if you have some classical code, you know it can protect bit flip errors, but it can't correct phase flip errors. And so they ask the same question, how do I uh, um, protect a quantum, quantum diary or protect a quantum, quantum information? And so the kind of the first answer is the CSS codes. Um, I'm just quickly saying this, I won't be able to say too much about how this works in this setup. Um, 
but essentially they're ways of constructing quantum codes from two compatible classical codes. And so we're going to ask, uh, is there something similar Alice can do to turn a classical channel quantum? Um, I won't really be able to tell you exactly how this works, but I'll have one quick slide on that. Um, so first we're just gonna focus on entanglement and coherence dynamics. So now that we're going to potentially have coherence in the system, we'll also be able to have entanglement, and I just wanna remind you that coherence is bounding entanglement. And so if Alice wants to save her diary, we need to have volume law entanglement and volume law coherence. So now I'm going to add to my circuit these X and Z measurements. Uh, the total measurement rate is fixed at PM. I will measure the Z uh, operators at some relevant rate, one minus PX, and the X operators at some rate, PX. Measurements in the Z basis generate X coherence, but destroy Z coherence, and vice versa here. Um, and so after, at late times, the coherence will find some steady state and the entanglement will find some steady state bounded by that uh, steady state coherence. Um, the results uh, is that you find the, the half entanglement cut is almost always uh, area law. Um, so this system doesn't have a volume law phase. It has a critical point at this uh, when Px equals Pz. Um, that has uh, logarithmic scaling of entropy. Uh, you also get these logarithmic, um, or these critical entanglement distributions. Uh, I think the central charge for this is like, the fit is like 30, so don't take this too seriously. Um, but actually, you can explain how this works by uh, mapping the dynamics of coherence, um, or making a few approximations in this limit of small PM to find that the dynamics of coherence are almost Markovian. And so you can write down this rate equation, um, which says that the X coherence is either going to maximize or minimize based off of the uh, um, relative rates of X and Z measurements. And so if you're mostly measuring X measurements, say on this side, then the X coherence will be completely lost and you'll be unable to find uh, entangled states. Um, so this is another summary of that. Uh, so basically exactly what I said, if X measurements are larger than Z measurements, you get a state which is classical in the X basis. On this side of the, the transition, you have states that are classical in the Z basis. Um, this is, can be viewed as a competing classical code in this dynamical CSS codes. Uh, I don't expect you to understand this completely because I didn't say enough about it, but real fast, the basic statement is that in this limit, you can't predict bit errors, and in this limit, you can't protect phase errors. Uh, and so the number of logical qubits in your CSS code end up being zero. Um, so the generalization from CSS won't work in this setup. Um, so Alice needs to do something else. Um, actually, Bob can help her. So if Bob starts making measurements in the Y basis, he will start generating coherence uh, in the X basis. And so then you can actually tune into a volume law phase um, if you have a sufficiently large enough Y measurements uh, given the, the strength of your X and Z measurements. Um, here we show uh, what the transition looks like. Um, this is a transition to volume law and it appears to have some sharpening of the coherence also at this same point. Uh, we're still doing a little bit extra calculations to really nail down the critical point to see if they match. Um, but this, this expectation for where the critical point is tends to match what you see by eye. Um, okay, so that's entanglement. Um, what about Alice's ability to protect her diary? Well, this Y measurement way of generating a volume law phase isn't going to really work for Alice because Bob can maybe always tune to shine X or Z measurements. Uh, and in that case, Alice is never going to be able to, to decode. So Alice needs to have some way to generate coherence on her own, and she can do this with phase gates, uh, which will generate any, uh, coherence in the X basis. And so uh, this is the circuit we'll consider. We have this coherent bit eraser um, that essentially makes bit errors, but in a way that preserves coherence. Then we also have these decohering X measurements and a certain rate, the phase gate. Um, and we're fixing the rate at which Bob can make measurements to be something small. And so if Alice can only apply a small rate of phase gates, 
then she can only protect a certain ratio of uh, decohering to cohering preserving errors um, until she has a sufficiently large enough amount of coherence she can generate in the system. And so you can kind of think of this as the regime where she can only can protect a classical state, or here she can protect a quantum state. Uh, and that's, I guess, kind of the, the full story of Alice's need for coherence. If she has no coherence, she can only protect uh, classical information, um, and she must dynamically generate coherence uh, to protect quantum information. Uh, all of this can kind of be traced back to this coherence bound on entanglement. So if the system loses coherence, you can't have entanglement, and so you can't protect quantum information. Uh, and again, Alice can't use the same approach as the CSS code, so uh, essentially because she can't perform active feedback throughout the circuit. She's only collecting measurements. Um, okay, uh, I guess real quick, I will show you what I find an interesting result for the constraints on the code distance by coherence. So a general error correction code is formed off of n bits. It can protect k qubits, or logical bits, and has, can, make, can protect up to d errors. Um, and so the bound is formed by taking any single qubit subspace of this stabilizer code. Uh, you form some state um, from that subspace, and then you maximize the coherence of that state within that code space, and that provides a bound on the code distance. Um, this coherence has to be of a local poly basis, and this code has to be a stabilizer code. Um, if you apply this bound to a CSS code, you recover the classical singleton bound defined on the codes that make up the CSS code. Um, and so that's uh, the, what I wanted to tell you. If Alice has no coherence, she can only protect classical diaries. Uh, Bob can help her protect and generate entangling phases um, if he makes measurements in the Y basis. But for the general ability to protect a uh, quantum diary, Alice needs to apply a certain rate of phase gates. Um, this was all for this Alice-Bob game, but uh, there's a more general requirement for quantum error correction that the code distance is kind of bounded by this, this essentially almost minimum coherence because uh, you can do it, you can minimize, you can take this maximum over any su single qubit subspace. And so if you take the minimum over all single qubit subspaces, you almost get something like the second least coherent state of your subspace, of your code space uh, is what's giving you the bound on this code distance. 